Hello, so in this video we're going to continue working on the first person controller. If you haven't seen the first first person controller video and the input system video, I recommend checking them out. They are very short. So let's add a new action for sprinting and assign it to left shift. In our player script, let's get a reference to it in the awake method, as always. In our get movement input method, we can get the float value from this action and make a new multiplier variable with it. If it's more than zero, it's gonna be 1.5, otherwise it's gonna be just one. And we're gonna multiply the movement speed by that variable. And now if we hold shift, we go 50% faster. Now, if your controller is super simple and if this is all there is to the sprinting system, this is all right. But if you want to add more logic, like for example, if you want to add a stamina system to your sprinting, then you might want to move all of that into a separate file. Like, for example, if you want to add crouching or like wall running, you can just add everything to your player CS file. It's going to get very big and it's going to be very hard to figure out what's going on. So instead of doing this, let's make an instance variable called movement speed multiplier and let's make it internal. Internal means visible only to the current assembly. Let's also add an event called on before move. And in our update movement method, we're going to set the movement speed multiplier to one and we're going to call our event. This allows any external scripts to hook into our player controllers lifecycle. It basically says, Hey guys, I'm about to do the movement calculation logic. If you have anything to do before that happens, you can do it now. And we're going to take advantage of that in our sprinting script. So on the player object, let's create a new script and call it player sprinting. And here let's include the input system namespace. And let's grab references to our player script, to the player input component and to our sprint action. Let's also add a field for the speed multiplier. And let's add a method called on before move where we're going to read the sprint action value. And if it's more than zero, we're going to multiply the player's movement speed multiplier by our speed multiplier. Otherwise, we're just going to multiply it by one. And of course, we need to register this method on enable and unregistered on disable. And lastly, since the script doesn't make sense without our player script, we're going to add a require component attribute to it. This makes sure that we can't add the script without the player script on the game object. And if you hit play, you'll see that it's still working. Now, as I've already mentioned, because we declared the movement speed multiplier as internal, it will only be visible to the current assembly. As you can see, it's not shown in the editor, which is what we want. And also we can create a new folder for all of our player controller scripts and add an assembly definition file here. In this assembly, we wanna make sure that we can still use the input system by adding it to the list here. And now it's still working as before, but internal variables are now inaccessible to any script outside of this folder. So now we can add more scripts with more features in them and share data between them easily without worrying about the whole thing becoming too open and the public interface becoming too bloated. And another thing that I want to point out is that since our player sprinting class inherits from Mona behavior, we can easily enable and disable it at runtime. So we can, for example, make a trigger cube with a sprint activator component on it. And when something collides with it, we can check that it's the player and we can check that the player has the sprinting component. And if it does, we can enable it and destroy our game object. This can be useful if you're making, for example, a tutorial level and you want to introduce new mechanics gradually. So you want to activate your sprinting script only when the player reaches a certain point on the level. And now, of course, with our sprinting being in a separate file, we can easily add new logic to it. For example, we can expose the velocity vector and in our sprinting script, we can calculate the dot product of player's forward vector with the player's velocity. If the player is moving forward, it's going to be 1. If the player is tracing, it's going to be 0. And if the player is going backwards, it's going to be minus 1. Then we're clamping it to the 0, 1 range to get only the positive values. And finally, we're mapping it from the 0 to 1 range to 1, 2 speed multiplier range. And what it does, of course, is it prevents the player from sprinting sideways or sprinting backwards. And of course, it doesn't make sense to calculate all of that if the player is not trying to sprint. So let's add an early return here. And of course, we can test it now to make sure that we can only sprint forward. 